Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Buzz. Hi, welcome to the Kiwi Mata Buzz. This is episode 5. And this is uh, another one in the series from the MBA Viral Resistance Conference or seminar. And today we have uh, Dr. Mark Goodwin speaking. He's from Plant and Food Research in New, in New Zealand. And he's going to discuss the viral resistance uh, issues. He brought up some great points and um, to sit back and have a listen. And remember, if you want to keep up with our blog, it, we're at... Uh, kiwimana.co.nz Thanks for listening guys. Enjoy the speech. Cheers. Dr. Mark Goodwin. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm Mark Goodwin. I lead the um, Honey Bee and Pollination Research Team at Plant and Food Research uh, here based in Hamilton. Just wondering whether this is the biggest beekeeping group I've ever talked to at the same time. There's a lot of people in the room at the moment. The subject I want to talk on is kind of a relatively serious one, um, and it's kind of serious one to start off with, and that's the development of varroa that are resistant to the chemicals that um, we use to treat them. And I thought as a way of introducing the subject at least, I would read an email that was put on a distribution list um, just last year from a beekeeper in this region, which I thought he did a really good job of kind of highlighting the issues. I look around the room, I'm not sure if I can see him here. If I see somebody shrink in their chair in the back row, I'll know that he is. Okay, this year, once honey was finished, I applied apistain strips to my hives as usual for the statutory eight weeks and took them out during late March, early April. Everything up to that point looked honky-dory. When I back, went back one month later to get hives prepared for winter, I was shocked at what I found. Wing-damaged bees, newly hatched cadavers st st strewn all over the floor and outside the hive. Adult mites, sorry, adult mites on bees and hive parts generally reduce bee numbers and greater than normal hive losses. I have since acquired a resistance test kit, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes and found the apistan kill efficiency ranges from 0 to 50% on those hives tested. That's a far cry from the 95% I traditionally come to expect. I have since purchased and applied a different non-flavalinate product to knock the mites back before winter starts in earnest. I always knew this day was coming, but it was certainly sneaked up and caught me by surprise. Here in the Auckland area, we've had 10 good years out of apistan, but it seems to be mimicking the North American experience of finding significant resistance after a decade. Let this be a warning. I hope you don't get caught out like me. And it's a very, a very valid warning. And what I want to do is show you some of the results, at least, um, what we've got around for AP Stan, uh, sorry, for Varroa Control products. And I want to talk about the future for synthetic chemical control in New Zealand. And then lastly, I want to talk about life after synthetic controls. What happens if and when we no longer have these fancy strips available to put into beehives. The normal way we test resistance, and we've got some fancy lab tests and bioassays that we can do. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to do those sorts of things. So we've had to use a separate method and what happened, what we use is this um, resistance test. And it's the same one that a writer in this email was referring to. And if you want to know all about it, um, I'll recommend right at the start this book, uh, Control of Varroa in New Zealand. Um, I think you can probably buy one outside, outside the room here. Um, myself and uh, Michelle wrote it. Um, we actually don't get any royalties for it, so it's, this is not an advert on our part. But if you want to know any of this sort of information, like how to do a resistance test, it's all in here. Um, but the, basically, this USDA test, you get a piece of cardboard and you put a little measured piece of strip on it. You put about 300 bees in it. You put a sugar cube in it. 
you leave it sitting for 24 hours, then you shake out, hopefully, all the dead mites. Well, you hope there's lots of dead mites. Then you wash the bees in alcohol and see how many live mites are still alive. When Vera first came into New Zealand, MAF asked us to do this to see whether there was any level of resistance. And what you can see from this graph here, and I, that um, our AP stand test killed about 100% of the mites. None of the, even that little piece of AP stand that we stapled to the, to the strip killed everything. Since then, we've had a number of phone calls from beekeepers, I would guess one or two a year, where the people have rung up and said, look, I think we've got I've got resistance. For some reason, they put strips in, and they didn't seem to have any effect. Every time we've investigated it, we've just not been able to find any real evidence for resistance. However, a year or so ago, we got another one of those phone calls. Um, beekeeper was really convinced. He said, look, I've got my strips in my hive, and there's varroa running around everywhere. So he's, we got him to send us a sample and we, so we could test with this USDA test. And lo and behold, instead of it killing 95% or 99% of the mites, it only killed about 20%, which was a, a really good hint that perhaps we are dealing with resistance. The next thing we did just to make sure our test was working was rushed out outside the lab and took some bees from one of our hives and tested those. And of course, they tested the way they should do, that it indicated that at least our bees weren't resistant, even if this first beekeeper was resistant. Then, just a year ago, we got a phone call from a hobbyist beekeeper uh, in Hamilton, who actually is in the room, um, I met him before, who said, I think I've got resistance. So we went and tested his hives, and sure enough, um, our USDA test, at least, indicated that they had resistance, in this case, to apistan. We also tested Bavrol as well and found the same results from it. So where did we have at that point results that we found believable at least to suggest that we had resistance to at least some of our Varroa control products? And this is what the picture looked like up to about a week ago. Um, Northland, Auckland, and down here in Hamilton. We, we've had reports that were either very credible or that we had actually done a little bit of checking on. Now, the National Beekeeping Association has been very, very proactive on this, and what they're trying to do at the moment is carry out a survey to see we, actually where resistance is. Um, you, one thing you can be sure that the places you know it is is not everywhere. There's lots of other places. So what they've done is contacted a whole lot of beekeepers, and I'm assuming some people in this room, and they asked them to send us the, our lab samples of be, about 300 bees from a number of hives as they were taking their strips out of the hive. Okay, so as the strips were coming out, they were to collect samples of bees. Interestingly, I think most of the samples were people have sent us from the South Island and very few from the North Island for some reason. Um, I'm not sure what to read into that one, but at least we did get some from the North Island, and I'll show you some of those results shortly. What we do with them is we just wash them in alcohol to see how many mites there are on there. And what should happen is there should be none. If your strips are working and you take a sample of bees and wash it, you should not find any mites at all. And all the South Island samples, it's exactly what we found, or I should say didn't find. When we wash them in alcohol, there's no varroa there at all. However, however, we did get two lots of samples from the North Island, or three lots, one was zeros, but we'll look at these other two. Um, and I'll show you four apiaries where beekeepers have tested about eight colonies in them. They've sent us the sample and we've washed them in alcohol. And you can see this first one, remember there should be zero mites, but the worst colony there has up to 80 mites per 300 bees. Now, this is a hive that had, in this case, apistan in when the sample was taken. The, the apistan had been there for eight weeks. There should be no mites at all. And we have other hives around there that have mites in as well. Second apiary, third apiary, and a fourth apiary with a different beekeeper, and this time, Bavrol. The thing to notice is that in a lot of these hives, AP stand for the first beekeeper, Bavrol for the second year, 
beekeeper, is not killing all of Roy any longer. It's in the South Island samples. It is not in the North Island samples. And we would expect these hives with hive numbers over 20 per bee, 20 varroa per 300 bees, are probably going to die over winter. Okay? Um, the ones with less sips, between 10 and 20, I'm not sure what's going to happen. We don't have enough informa information to know how well they're going to survive. But certainly the high ones, and absolutely the ones that are over 60 or 80, are probably already dead, as we're speaking now, I would imagine. The row is already done for them. Now, if I was the beekeeper concerned here, um, this has got to be, a, this particular beekeeper's got to, with the first three, it's got to be a particularly worry time, because they've got to do something here because they're going to face significant losses if they don't. Now, did we just pick up the worst beekeeper in the North, in the North Island to send us samples? I asked him, and he says, no, I don't think we've got resistance, was the answer to that question. Um, I'm guessing he's not. I'm guessing there's people in the room who've got beehives that are in a worse situation than the ones that we're showing up here. The other interesting thing I want to point out at the moment I'll explain where these samples are in a minute. The other thing we had a chance to do, which we hadn't had a chance to do before, was some people sent us samples after APVAR had been used. Um, well, actually, one beekeeper did, and we've got a yard where we've used it as well. And the results for using APVAR, the top graph is after the following the label, eight for eight weeks, and then taking a sample of bees directly after the treatment finished. As you'll see, we've got really still quite high levels after using um, APVAR as well. The bottom one, this is a beekeeper sent us, had used APVAR, I think the word's illegally, I'm not quite sure what the legality is, for 15 weeks. And as you'll see, there's still some hives there with significant numbers of varroa when those treatments are coming out. Is this resistance as well? We, I don't think so. But it's hard, although the results are, look the same, um, so whether it is or not is probably a little bit irrelevant, it may be that, this, that for APVAR it's variation in the ability of the product to control varroa. I always get phone calls from beekeepers about products they're using, and for APVAR they fall into two categories. One where the beekeeper tells me greatest thing since sliced bread controls all my varroa, um, although they tend not to have tested. Second one, where people take them out and they like the top one, where they see, still see varroa running around in their hive as they're taking them out. So what it tells us, and I'm going to say this about four or five times as we go through, you can no longer have absolute trust in synthetic chemicals if you're using them to control varroa at the moment. So... This is what our distribution looks like at the moment. We've got some extra dots we've added all the way down to the middle of the um, North Island at the moment. Um, mostly the areas where there aren't dots in the North Island are because we do not have samples. So the fact there are do no dots, don't read that as we don't have resistance. It really means as we don't know. So what, where the base level, what you should be doing is, unless you have evidence to the contrary now, you should be assuming that you do have. And I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like and what you have to do. How fast is it going to spread? Well, we don't have any really good evidence. The best we've got is from England. And the English who decided this was a really major problem, spent a million pounds on it a year, every year, um, for about four or five years. And they, the, the red dots are where they had resistance, and the green dots are all the apiaries they checked that they didn't. And to, our, our evidence is not quite so good because, um, let's say, the British government spent a million pounds a year at the moment, and the New Zealand government spent, I think, we're up to $150 now, so we've got a little way to catch up yet. <laughs> so uh, it's my way of apologising. We don't quite have this sort of level of information. As it, we go through time here, um, 2003, we're starting to see a few dots, extra dots out from there. And again, and again, starting to, you see it's starting to spread through um, England. If you look at New Zealand, it appears as though it's either spread faster from our initial find just north of Auckland, 
Well, what's more than likely is that our initial find north of Auckland was not the first one. We weren't that lucky. That there was already resistance happening elsewhere that people didn't know. A year ago, beekeepers, this time last year, last spring, people were reporting bigger than normal hive losses. It may be that resistance was having a problem then as well as what we see now. The other reason it's really hard pr to predict is we shift huge numbers of hives around. England does it. Um, probably 100,000 or more hives get shifted during the season from one place to another. So that if they're carrying resistant mites, they are going to be shifted around. And we were lucky that we had a much bigger variety of chemicals to use and still do at this point in time. England really just had one chemical they started off with, which is apistan. When they got resistance, they had to change to another one, which is, a, is not a good strategy at least. So you can't make too many comparisons. But if you look at where it's spread already, you would have to imagine it's not going to take a lot of time, um, even if it's not already in these other regions, to actually get to them. So the question I guess you've all got to ask is, you, do you have resistance? Uh, oh, this is not a normal bee out of a hive. This is what happens when you drop a bee into a jar of Varroa, by the way. But it, it's, a, hasn't it? it's quite an effective photograph. So how do you know? You could do the way that we're doing in our survey. You can go and sample after you've treated. And I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to repeat this 20 times to you because I think you need to do this. Um, but I know that it's really difficult. If you've got one hive, yeah, sure, take the treatment out and, te and test. If you've got 5,000, it becomes a much, much, much bigger problem. Or you can get fancy and you use this USDA test, get a copy of the manual and uh, read out how to do it. Now, here's the don'ts. And unfortunately, the don'ts is what everybody does. Um, don't look for PMS. That's the symptoms of high row levels. Why? Because it's too late. The damage is done. And it doesn't always happen with high row levels. Don't, and I know a lot of you do this, you assess varroa levels by looking for deformed wing virus. Like, you know those bees with those curly wings? Um, again, that's not a good way of assessing what your varroa levels are like. Don't, and I keep having to say this one to everybody, don't go looking for varroa. To give you an example, when we, our first experience with varroa with that resistance test, we, had to, we wanted jars of, of 300 bees with about 50 varroa in each. We looked through those hives, we could hardly find any. And it was going to be a bit embarrassing when we reported back to MAF that, well, uh, we couldn't find enough varroa to test. So we went and caught two bees that we could see varroa in to make sure they were in each jar. When we went and washed them afterwards, we found over 200 varroa in each jar. We couldn't see them. And I don't... And my eyesight, I have glasses, it's probably about as good as yours. Um, looking for varroa is not a good way of detecting it, that you've got resistance. You need to sample. And the last way of finding out you've got resistance, which I guess lots of beekeepers are going to use, um, is you wait for dead colonies. It's a very expensive way of working out whether you have or haven't got resistance, though. So, the hard question is, and this is a really hard question. How many colonies do you sample? If you've only got one, easy answer there. Um, if you've got 5,000, it's much harder. And if you go and look at these apiaries, if you'd only sampled one hive in each apiary, you might have got a hive that just doesn't have resistant mites in it. So we're probably looking at least half an apiary, but at this stage we don't have a good picture for what the distribution of these resistant mites through a colony is. So the best advice we can give, and I realize it's not great advice, but it is the best, is how many hives are you prepared to lose? It's very expensive to lose hives. Um, if you don't want to lose any, then you really need to have been checking every colony to make sure the treatment's worked. So what are the future? What's the future for um, synthetics now? They used to be a magic bullet which is great. You could put the strips in your hives and go on holiday. Forget about varroa. What's varroa? Goodness me. Um, no residues in honey. It's 
and very low residues in wax. So these, these things were great. So where do we go with them at the moment? Now that we know that some of them, you can't guarantee that they work any, any longer. The one thing you don't do is put them in and go on holiday, that's for sure. Still alternate chemicals like you are hopefully all have been doing already. The second thing you need to do and a behavior that everybody needs is going to need to change in this new era of resistance is you have to treat colonies early. None of this will wait till May to put our strips in um, business. And the reason why, and you'll see a couple of curves here for how quickly Varroa builds up in colonies. Um, one of them is if it, on drone brood and one's in worker brood. Um, it reproduces faster on drone brood. If you treat here and it doesn't work, varroa levels are still pretty low when you have to try and find something else to do. If you want to delay your treatment down to here, by the time you find out your treatment didn't work, your options for doing anything about it is about zero. And I get phone calls from beekeepers in the beginning of June as they're taking their strips out saying, I've got high varroa levels, what do I do? Well, I could tell you what you could have done if you had treated in the beginning of February. Leaving it so late, the chances are your colonies are going to die. There is probably nothing that you can do at that point if your treatments have failed completely. So the second message, take-home message here, is give some serious thought to taking the honey off and treating earlier. The biggie is you can't assume that your treatments have worked you've got to go back and check. And if they haven't worked, then you've got to retreat uh, again with something else that is going to work. Or what's the option here? The option here is to accept some level of losses. What that level looks like, is it 5% of your outfit? Probably not, actually. I'm guessing it's somewhere between 20 and 50% of your outfit every year um, won't survive. And... That's rough, that's rough if you've only got one hive, but if you've got 10,000 hives, that's a major commercial loss. Um, and a lot of beekeeping businesses wouldn't be able to survive those sorts of losses. So that's the message with synthetics. Alternate chemicals, treat early, check that it's worked, and retreat if needed. Hmm. Are there any other silver bullets out there? Well, there is one. It's not quite a silver bullet because there are some issues with residues, particularly in wax. Um, and it's uh, Kumafos, and it's used extensively through North America, and it's used all the way through Europe. It's another strip formulation. Um, Bayer came and um, looked to see if they could get it registered in New Zealand, and they took it to the EPA, who consider these things. And the beekeeping industry at that point in time, and two or three years ago, not, perhaps four years, said, oh, we don't want it because of residue profile. We don't want to see residues in wax. So EPA turned to Bayer and said, sorry, guys, we're not going to approve it. Um, Bayer said, well, what about resistance? And they said, well, come back when we've got resistance, when you've got resistance, and we'll rethink it. Bayer's view on it, and this is a private quote that they'll probably shoot me at some stage for repeating, was that they're not going to come back unless the beekeeping industry asks them, basically. They spent a lot of money getting that far. So unless they're convinced that people actually want it, there's no point in them going back through the registration process. Even if they did, it would probably take a couple of years to get it, make, take it, sorry, at least a year to get through the whole process and get um, onto the market. But that said, it is, some, it is something that needs to be considered at this point in time. Um, I think it's if the National Beekeeping Association and BIG want something to mull over in their meetings, this is probably it. Either decide you don't want it, or decide that you do want it, but don't just decide nothing, because um, it's, there's a big enough problem out there now that you, it's got to be treated a little more seriously than that. So that's the only other silver bullet, or anything that looks like a silver bullet out there. Works great for varroa control as long as you don't have resistance, um, but there are issues around with the chemistry. The other slight advantage, and I don't know whether I'm advocating this, any of this or not, is that the more chemicals we can put into our control program, it may 
delay the res development, further development of resistance to the rest of the chemicals. Something to think about at least. So life after synthetics, and this is really about what a lot of the other presentations you're going to listen to today are about. And there's lots of other potential treatments um, that do fit broadly into organic treatments, um, except for the queen along the end there, but I guess that's, queens are organic like everything else. Formic acid, oxalic acid, um, thymol, um, either the proprietary products out there that you can go and buy from your beekeeping um, supplier, or the generic products that you can go and buy from a chemical manufacturer and at a fraction of the price and use yourself. Again, if you want a full description of them, I could rec the, recommend the book. Formic acid we have here and oxalic acid. Um, oxalic acid is really great because it's even cheaper than using sugar. So if you're worried about price. Problem with them are, and, and here's a selection of some of the generic products, their effectiveness varies. They, AP stand is usually about nearly 100%, so they're not as effective. So that's the first issue. And the second one is that even though that on average, the first one, their mite wipes, looks like about 85%, which is great, if you go and look at interval individual hives in an apiary, this is what you tend to find. It works really, again, we've got hives down the, along the bottom, and we've got row numbers, row kill rate at the top. Some of them are great. Good as apistan, kills 100%. But you'll see there's other hives there that it doesn't. That it's only killing a low number and those colonies probably aren't going to survive um, through the season. So we, we see big variation. So if you want to use organics, and you've seen this list before, twice I think already now, but we'll do it again. If you can use all these organics and they're absolutely usable, but what do you have to do? You've got to alternate chemicals still, treat early, Check to make sure it's worked, and then retreat if necessary. It's the same message as if you're using the synthetic chemicals. So for the same reason, they may or may not work. We can't guarantee. We can no longer guarantee it. I just for uh, there's a couple of other treatments out there I didn't mention. Um, thermal fogging. This is, I think this is built for all the guys out there actually, because um, guys like machines, and this is brightly coloured and and. Uh, and buzzes and has lots of smoke and can, has the potential of blowing your hive up as well. So it's a great entertainment. Um, I'm not sure we're quite convinced whether it works or not, but uh, to heck with that, it's fun to use. Um, drone trapping. Um, Varroa are attracted to drone brood. Uh, mesh floorboards. So there's lots of other methods out there you can use. And the one that the rest of, the, the rest of this uh, today is going to be talking about, which is tolerant queens. And the idea is to be able to put all of these together in the end as a IPM program. Instead of just having a magic bullet that you put in, you're using a number of different techniques to keep those row levels low enough so your colonies can survive with it. So in summary, what are the options out there for everybody? The first option is... Mostly the one we're doing, although today's would suggest it's more than that, is the do-nothing approach. Lose increasingly, and what's the result going to be? We're going to see increasing hive losses. Um, whether it gets up to 30 or 35% of all our hives every year, we won't know until it happens, but it's not going to be insignificant. The other danger with... Uh, not doing anything is beekeepers will make their own decisions and will start doing things that really they shouldn't be doing and then you have some real problems like we see around the rest of the world at times when people use illegal chemicals um, when they're hard up because of a problem they've got. So that's the first option and certainly not the recommended. There's a middle ground. I put short term. I have no idea what short term looks like here. Um, that's the check mite, the kumafos, that's this other magic bullet, sort of magic bullet, that's sitting out there at the moment. And be, before we throw it, be, if we're just going to decide not to do it, we need to at least give it some, consider, use it, some careful thought at least. And the biggie, I guess, where we really want to get to, and that's an integrated control program. That's no longer relying just on synthetic chemicals, 
but using all of the tools we've got available to control Varroa. The problem is it's much more expensive, much more difficult. You've got to be much more better beekeepers. And the queens that we're talking about kind of fit into the integrated control program as well. So you'll get a lot of this over the next, with the next speakers. Integrated control is a long-term solution. If you look at most other industries out there, this is the way they're heading, heading away from just chucking a chemical in and going to testing and treating only when necessary and using a variety of treatments. It's, the, I guess, the way forward. But the problem is you've got to make it work with your business somehow, and that's the difficult thing. So my last slide here, because my time's nearly up. It's, you can always take a sigh of relief when you get to the one with the conclusions. The first conclusion is, and I, it's not up there, I don't think, no, is we do have resistance. I think the evidence is now pretty firm that we have resistance to synthetic chemicals in New Zealand. Some of you in this room have got hives, I think it's probably guaranteed, that whatever treatment you use this autumn either didn't work very well or didn't work at all and your hives may not survive till spring. And that's the mess. definitely take that message home. Don't assume you, ha you don't have it. Alternate chemicals still. Use something different in the spring. Treat early. That's at least in the autumn. Remember, get your honey crop off early, treat early. You've got to work, work some, out some way of doing that. Check to make sure it's worked. Don't just get one of your workers to take your strips out and then go on holiday. You've got to go and sample it. And the last one is to um, retreat if you need to, checking on levels of row you've got. So that's the message. Resistance, it is a serious problem. It's a big change to management practices now if you want to better keep bees in such a situation. And later speakers, as I say, will talk about some of the integrated control as far as queens are concerned. So we'll take questions now, if anybody has any. If I haven't shocked everybody too much. We'll get, you'll get a microphone, microphone. will be. With the, um, where you had the hives that had the resistance, where some hives had high resistance to the treatments in one apiary and others the treatment worked, was any study done to see if the, the failing hives were in poor positions, like cold or damp or wet, whether the ones the treatments had worked on were in sunny or better positions? That's a great question. Um, what, we, what we needed, and thinking in hindsight, which is, which is really wonderful, is that we need to do repeat some of this with a map to know where all the hives were exactly and, and which ones were resistant and not. So at the moment, we don't know the answer to that question, but I think we should, because it's, it's a very good question. Thank you for that one. Uh, the, the dose of apistan we're using is traditionally two strips per brood box. Is there any point in actually increasing that dose, or does it become toxic? I mean, with antibiotics and things, one of the causes of resistance is giving too low a dose, for example. Should we be increasing the dose of apistan? That's another good question about whether if we just increase the concentration or the dose of the chemicals we're using, and particularly we're talking about apistan here, whether it'll suddenly become effective. The answer is it might, but you might buy yourself six months. Now that you've got resistance, it'll, everything will develop very quickly after that time. Um, luckily, with, the, with apistan and bavrol, you could, I'm guessing, bavrol, you could double the dose without any negative effects on the bees. Apistan, probably, but I really don't know. Whether a sample of drones would be a suitable sample for testing for Varroa? I'm guessing yes. But w
Ah, oh, okay. I'll get them off, uh, off you afterwards. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I've treated my uh, hives with uh, Apivar this uh, autumn, as you, you say to do, and then uh, after I've taken the strips out, after about a few weeks after that, I put um, powdered sugar all over them and put a sticky board underneath my bottom board with a screen, and I found uh, one hive was 50 mites uh, after you know, the treatment. So would that be too bad or not, not too bad? The, the question was whether if you got 50 mites and might dro drop, whether it would be too many. The problem is we don't know from the sugar syrup what percentage of the mites you got off. If, we, if you got them all off and there was only 50, that's probably okay. If there was actually 5,000 and the sugar only got off 50, then that's not okay. So without knowing the effectiveness. The best way of t telling is a jar and do a sugar shake, or better still, a jar with 300 bees and wash them in alcohol or methylated spirits or something like that. Um, it, we know, we know how, how all the numbers stack up at, at that point and, and you can make good predictions from it. Mark, some time ago you spoke about good housekeeping bees, probably about two years ago, when you were looking for bees um, which would clean out the brood chamber, the bees seemed to know when there was a mite in there. Are you still pursuing that? Um yeah, uh, Michelle's talk going to give you 20 minutes on that very subject, so I'll leave it to her to answer that one, but okay, good question. Thank you. Still, still working on it at the moment. There's, um, this is our program on metarhizium. Um, sometimes it seems like we're taking three steps backwards for every two we take forward. Um, so I wouldn't hold your breath on that being on the market anytime soon, unfortunately. Remember again, if it is, it fits into integrated control, it's still not a magic bullet. Uh, I know with, um, with treatment of some other parasites and other species, there's a lot of dual active products, and obviously this will be this not, not probably not a long-term solution, but has any been wor work been done on um, either using two chemicals at the same time to knock down um, you know, the ones that are resistant to one chemical may not be resist resistant to the other? Okay, you got that question? We, I, I agree entirely, great idea. Um, the worst thing you can do is introduce one chemical till you have resistance and then introduce the next one, which is what the rest of the world has done. The middle ground is what we've done, alternate spring and autumn. The best ground is you introduce a product that has a whole lot of different chemicals at the same time. We thought it was a great idea. We did a literature search, sorry, a patent search to see if anybody else had thought of it. And somebody's got a patent. And when we asked them whether they would be interested in us doing that, they said no. So unfortunately, yeah, really good practice. It may be a bit late now that we've already got resistance to some of these chemicals, but we're not allowed to do it either, unfortunately. One of the reasons in Britain that the, um, uh, the treatments were uh, staged was the thought that if you removed the selection pressure for resistant mites for a while, you would breed sensitive mites back into the population. In other words, resistance isn't a one-way street. You can breed it in and you can breed it out. What yeah, are your so thoughts about that? Yeah, so the comment was, if we took away apistan and Bavril and just used apivar and some other things, hopefully, whether the resistance would disappear? Um, the answer is yes. It's been done. It's been tried in a couple of places. A um, couple of years, the resistance will disappear. Problem is, once you start treating, it comes back very, very quickly. You're back. It's only a year before, once you start to coming in, in because there are still some resistant mites in the population. They breed up really quickly and you're back where you started from. So it seemed a really good idea to go down that track, but in practice, it doesn't seem to buy enough by much time. And everybody would have to cooperate, which is a little tricky as well. <laughs> I can tell you that. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is that we have time for two more quick questions. Uh, the good news is that Mark will be back this afternoon for a panel discussion. And the other bit of good news is we're going to break for morning tea at the moment. And actually we've managed to cater for all of you. Uh, as I say, that's the other bit of good news. So if you all eat sparingly, even those of you who haven't registered can partake of morning tea, lunch and afternoon tea. So if we take two more quick questions, break for morning tea and then be back sort of on time, we can get the whole day sort of proceeding smoothly. So any other questions that... Hey, Mark. Um, just one question. Do you think it would be prudent to set up a number of sites throughout the North Island um, as permanent markers for resistance and continually sample bees from those sites against various miticides or the varroa against the miticides? So I assume you got that question, whether it would be good to have some permanent sites around New Zealand to monitor for resistance? That, um, I haven't really thought about that one. That's a possibility. I'm not sure whether it would, how much further on it would get you from just getting beekeepers to provide their own samples to, for their own outfits. I mean, in the end, the answer is beekeepers should be answering this question for themselves, that there isn't the, the money to, unfortunately, to be able to test all your hives and determining whether you do have resistance yourselves. Last question, Russell. So Russell. So Russell. Would it be prudent for beekeepers where the bees have left the strips not to send you bees in for testing for in a dead condition because that could easily give a false indication of whether we have resistance or not. Yep, yep. some you and R Russell's point was that when you go to take your strips out, you'll see in some cases the cluster has moved away from the strips. Um, the very question we ask every beekeeper where we think we've got resistance is that one to make sure that, and like the one I showed result I showed you on Bavril, the strip, the small cluster, the strips they're clustered hanging onto the strip. Um, but yeah, make sure that um, when you do test it, that the bees are actually in contact with the strip. But very, very good point, Russell. All right, thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mark, for your time. We'll break now for morning tea. If we'll be back here in 20 minutes, that'll be great. Thank you.